Well, I want to thank you for joining us. I know it's been a couple of months since we've done a Bible study on a Tuesday night that you've been able to view. I hope that we can kind of get these wheels to spin again and get you into the habit of doing Bible study once a week with me. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings of this day and pray that you would inspire us with your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, listen, we're going to do uh, take a really deep look, an in-depth look at Luke chapter 8. This was a lesson if you're in a Lutheran church or a Catholic church or a Methodist church or a church that uses, a Presbyterian church, a church that uses uh, the uh, lectionary and so forth. You would have read this lesson on Sunday and you probably got, oh, Jesus casts out demons from this guy and they went into pig and the pigs ran into the water and they drowned and guy was okay and he went and witnessed uh, for Jesus. And it, that's great. If that's what you got out of the lesson, fantastic. But there is such a richness and a depth to this lesson that we miss. First of all, by the nature of the fact that these are in little pericopes or lectionary sections here that you miss the context of it. But secondly, because there's so much richness to some of the Greek and the Hebrew that just doesn't translate well into English and something where you're just so culturally disconnected from these things. So I want to try to bring this passage alive for you. I am really going to geek out today on this, and I hope you will too. There actually is a handout. This was the sermon handout that we had attached to Sunday's lessons um, for the advertisement for Sunday worship this last week. Uh, the problem is I didn't use it. I just kind of pitched it. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it for Tuesday Bible study because this is much more appropriate for that. All right, so we're going to break this down into little sections. And let's start with this. So Jesus and his disciples sailed to the country of the Gerasenes opposite Galilee. Now, this is important because Jesus and his disciples are going on vacation. All right? It's vacay time. They have been bugged and prodded and uh, they've been everywhere they go. People are surrounding them and wanting to be fed. And uh, one to press upon Jesus. The disciples are tired. They want to get away from it all. So they decide the best place to go is into a Gentile area, the place of the Gerasenes, so they could get away from things. All right? Now, a little bit of context for this that actually is really important. Jesus had just spared his disciples from a storm that occurred on the lake. All right? Brought, have got, Jesus said, if you remember what Jesus did, he spoke a word and, and, and calmed the storm. This is really important because it applies to today's lesson. If you don't know that context, you will miss some of the richness of today's lesson. So storm, roar, calmed by what? A word of Jesus. And you're like, what does that have to do with the lesson of throwing, casting out the pigs? Oh, 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 everything, everything, okay? But let, let's, first of all, look backwards to the Old Testament. There was a thing called Tiamat, chaos, a.k.a. The abyss, a.k.a. In, in Mesopotamian theology, Tiamat, they called it Tiamat. It's the exact same word. It has the exact same origination. These are both Semitic languages, the Mesopotamians, and the Jews both spoke Semitic languages. So they were just spelled differently. It's like, you know, us saying Satan in France, maybe they say Satan, I don't know, I, whatever. It's the same word, and you can recognize it as the same word, and a Jew would recognize this as the same word. Tiamat was the goddess of chaos, the goddess of chaos. And in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, uh, the God, let me tell you about Tiamat. Tiamat, oh, she nearly destroyed the whole world. She was kind of annoyed that her kids, who were, by the way, kind of noisy and, and so forth, the gods decided to conspire against Tiamat, and they killed her, her babies, and she was a little bit angry. And so she went on a rampage and was going to destroy everything. She was chaos, okay? 
And there was a god named Marduk who rose up and, and decided to confront Tiamat and won the victory. And then, hence, we get Mesopotamian religion and so forth. He cleaved Tiamat's body in two, and it became, uh, it became the earth. Okay, So this is their Mesopotamian uh, mythology and so forth. Um, by the way, I don't believe that anybody in Mesopotamia actually believed that. It was a political play that was read every single holiday to remind them of why they prayed to Marduk and why uh, the, the authority of the king and so forth. But I'm not sure whether they actually believed that mythology, but that was their mythology. Okay. Now, Tiamun, same word, is one of the very first words in Genesis chapter 1. Hmm, let me see. When God says the earth, the very first uh, verse, the earth was a formless void. Maybe that's your English translation. In the beginning, when God created the earth, the earth was a formless void. That's this word, okay? An abyss. It is chaos. So it's been translated in a very different way. So that's why I gave you this word abyss here, because that's how we're going to see it's translated in our text for today. The abyss. Oh, now you've got some background. Awesome. Okay. So in the Old Testament, when God, well, and this is the reason why Genesis 1 is set up the way it's set up, when God wanted to create order out of the abyss, out of the chaos that existed, God spoke a word, let there be light, and chaos was ordered. See, Tiamon is not even an animated being in Genesis 1, and that's kind of the point of Genesis 1, say, all you Mesopotamians, nah, 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 nah. Tiamon almost destroyed everything. Tiamon was ordered with a simple word by God in our theology. Just bam, just like that. This is exactly what Jesus does with a simple word. Jesus calms a storm. Hmm. Who does that say Jesus is? I'll let you think on that one for a moment. All right. So Jesus brings order out of chaos with a simple word. Now here he is coming to the place of the Gerasenes. He came on land. Verse 27, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed by demons, who had put on, not put on clothing for a long time. He was not living in a house, but in the tombs. And seeing Jesus, he cried out before him with a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus? So the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. Now we're told a little bit about this demon-possessed man. And again, he is naked. All right, as a jaybird, as they say, right? He's naked, living most amongst the dead. He was possessed by demons. His life was marked by a great deal of violence, we are told. He'd been bound by the community to protect the community from him, and he kept breaking free from his chains. But interestingly, here comes Jesus, and he knows who Jesus is. He knows the identity of Jesus. Can't, the disciples like, can't we get a break? How does this guy know Jesus? We're trying to get away from it all. Hey, I'll tell you, I, I can understand. As a pastor, there are a lot of people who know me, and um, I don't always know them. Maybe I've seen them at a funeral or a wedding or whatever the case might be, or they've seen me at some type of an event. And I will, I'll sometimes go to an event 30, 40 miles away and thinking, oh, I'm getting away from it all, right? And then somebody says, Pastor Dave! And then they want to spend and talk to me. You know, it's just five minutes. It ends up being an hour, okay? Uh, and it's like, oh, my family's like, can't we just get away once in a while where you're not Pastor Dave, where you can just be dad and husband? And I think that's kind of how the disciples were feeling at this point. So here he is in the place of the garrisons, and this man identifies him and knows who he is. He calls him the Son of the Most High. Oh, my goodness, this phrase, Son of the Most High... By the way, Jesus' disciples don't even get it. Nobody gets it. But here this demon-possessed man gets who Jesus is. That is spectacular. This is an important, this is important. 
Because Jesus' disciples had just asked him, when they are caught in the storm, or right before this, who are you, Jesus? They wanted to know who Jesus is. The demon knew who he was. The disciples couldn't figure it out. Jesus had just calmed the storm with a word, brought order out of chaos, and they still couldn't figure out who Jesus is. This demon-possessed man got it. Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man and seized him many times. He was bound with chains and shackles, as we said. Verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? Wow. You know, you see a homeless person on the side of the road. How many of us have ever actually taken the time to ask their name? They're a real person. Maybe they had parents who loved them. A lot of cases I found that's true. They did. I know a homeless man I've, I've met and talked to is... He said, my parents would be so disappointed with me. He grew up in a very nurturing, loving family. He got addicted to drugs. This is not the path that his parents saw for him, but he's a human being. He has a name. He's a real person. Jesus takes the time to acknowledge that name. The man says, I'm legion. For many demons have possessed him. A legion is 6,000. 6,000 Roman soldiers. That was a legion. And so it's a reference to there are many demons possessing this man. Now people have asked me, I've actually had people concerned, am I, am I going to be possessed by a demon? What's going to happen? Oh my goodness, there's demons out there. You do not have to fear if you have Jesus. Even if you don't have Jesus, you don't have to fear unless you truly invite this in. And the only people who invite these types of things in are people who are empty, who have nothing. This man, for whatever reason, was empty. He's broken. He was filled with these demons. Didn't get a very good deal out of this bargain, did he? He was hoping to be filled with something. That doesn't mean that he took a Necromonicon, the, the Book of the Dead, which, you know, didn't really, uh, you know, what, uh, and read spells in it or something like that. No, that, that's just, when people are at their lowest point of life and they've got nothing worth living for, and we open ourselves up to be filled with something. And it's sad that this is where he turned to. So as he said, the reference of Legion may have been a reference to the number of demons inside him. That's a very traditional view of that. But it's also just as likely that he only had one demon. But the man had been a legionnaire, a Roman legionnaire. We don't know. We don't know how many. It's possible this man might be, have been suffering from what we call PTSD. You know, I had nephews, who, three of them, who fought in Iraq, Afghanistan. Every single one of them came home seriously, emotionally damaged. And it breaks my heart. We are almost 20 years on from there. It's hard to imagine. 20 years. They still wrestle with the things that they saw and had to do there. These things have a hold on you. How many of these men and women came home and couldn't deal with this and they killed themselves? I think it's a very plausible explanation who this man is. Maybe he had seen some things he could no longer live with. He was empty. And Jesus had such great compassion. Here's the thing. The demons and Jesus met their match. Oh, remember this? Hold on to that. That thought process about the storm, the chaos. Demons met their match. Let me read to you verse 31. 
they were imploring him not to commend them to go away to the abyss. They were afraid too. Because what is the life for a demon that's not in this world? The abyss, the chaos, the emptiness. Even demons want there to be some type of chaos. I don't know. We don't really have a really robust understanding of demons and demonology. And anybody who tells you that they do doesn't know uh, their head from a hole in a wall, quite frankly, because we just don't have enough information in the Bible. But nevertheless, these demons were terrified of this chaos, the chaos that pre-existed the creation of the world. They don't want to go back there. So maybe these demons had been, you know, wandering the earth and uh, since the ordering of, of creation. I don't know. Like I said, we is all speculation. We don't have a clue. We know very, we know this much about God. We even know less about demons and demonology and, and so forth. But they were afraid of this chaos. And it's meant to remind us, first of all, the lesson that just happened before here of Jesus calming of the ocean, the place of chaos. Tiamat was always associated with the oceans. It was a place of fear and terror. So in their telling of their mythology, the Tiamat, again, resided in the oceans. The demons did not want to go to the abyss, the place of chaos. But they met their match with Jesus. They implored him not to send them away to the abyss, but there was a herd of swine feeding there. And the demons implored Jesus to permit them to enter into the swine. They wanted to stay on this planet, on this earth. They didn't want to, they didn't want to have to, to go to that place of the abyss again because they were, if they didn't have something to reside in, I guess they went back to the abyss. I don't know. I don't understand all this stuff. So they met their match in Jesus, and they were persistent in their appeal not to be sent away. Now, here's the amazing thing about Jesus. He doesn't perform any rituals. You know, I, I've actually dealt with a Roman Catholic priest who, who was an expert in demonology because we had a situation that we thought was truly a legitimate circumstance about 20-some years ago, almost 25 years ago. And uh, there was this elaborate ritual that had to be placed together, and it, it took a lengthy period of time. Jesus doesn't go through any elaborate rituals. There's no holy water here, and there's no this, there's no that, or getting this together, saying a certain words, and so forth. He just does what again? Let's them go. Simple word. Again, remember Genesis 1, whenever you hear this type of stuff, you are meant to reflect upon the fact that God creates with a word, does things with a word, doesn't go through elaborate rituals or doesn't use his hands or whatever the case might be. And then we're told what happens to these, what happens to legion? All right, well, the demons came out of the man. So it just says Jesus gave him permission, simple word. And the demons came out of the man, and they entered into the swine. The herd rushed down a steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. Okay, that's actually hilarious. You should be, it is, you should be smacking your, your knee right now saying, that is so stinking funny. It actually is. Because the one place they didn't want to go was to the abyss. Water was affiliated again with Tiamat, the abyss. Okay? Where did the pigs take them? Right into the abyss. It's hilarious. I can imagine if you're a Jew listening to this being read, you would be busting up laughing because it's like funny as all get out. It's funny as heck. It's really funny. They got to the very place where they didn't want to go. Did Jesus do that? No, the pigs did it because pigs are, are animated beings with minds of their own. I don't know if you're aware of this. Pigs are ridiculous ridiculously bright animals, if you've ever dealt with pigs. And this is one of the, part of the story, whenever I do this, my daughter says, those pigs all died. You know, my daughter loves animals, right? The feeling of this man is at the expense of pigs, and that doesn't seem like a fair exchange. God is concerned about animals as well, too. In fact, part of the purpose that we are told that we're placed upon this earth is to make 
this earth livable for the animals. This is often wrongly interpreted to do with the animals as we please. It's not what that means. Okay? We are in charge to make sure the earth remains productive so the animals can flourish. So Jesus cares about these animals. Doesn't seem right. But what this story does do is it demonstrates the absolute danger that this man posed to the neighbors. That they would fill these pigs and the pigs would, would, were, were, were so enraged by being filled. They knew something was wrong. Again, Jesus did not direct the demons. He let them go into the pigs. But they were not directed, to, the pigs were not directed to run off a cliff into the abyss. Again, their death was unintended, but it was an unintended consequence. The pigs were agitated, they were frightened, they ran off the cliff. They're animated beings and creatures, and they had no room in their lives to share with these dang demons. They didn't want them inside themselves. They probably would rather die than live with these demons. They didn't invite them in unlike this human being. So again, I don't think it's a statement about the how expendable pigs are. I think the pigs is the point that we make that, that it's making here. These are precious creatures, creation of God. The pigs were not going to live and tolerate this. And we go on. Oh, isn't it rich? Isn't that cool? I hope you learned some things. We're going to go on to our response here in just a moment. This this creates all sorts of chaos in the community of the Gentiles. When the herdsmen saw what happened, they ran and reported it to the city and to the country. They ran and reported what they had heard. They were not testifying to the goodness of Jesus. They were upset about this. Well, you can imagine, they just lost their livelihood. They lost a lot of bacon that day, right? They are kind of ticked off. They were upset, and they were looking for support. They wanted to get rid of this Jesus because Jesus was a threat. Jesus wasn't the chaos. But isn't this what happens when healing comes in our life? People who bring thing, uh, straighten our lives out, sometimes there's a great deal of seeming chaos as a result of getting our lives together. Okay? And people who don't have their lives together don't like that. Sometimes they like things as they are. That's why it's so hard sometimes in our social systems for somebody who's sick to get well because we're all invested into that person being sick. That's how we've organized our life. I know it sounds twisted and sick, but that's the way we are. <sighs> People went out to see what happened. They came to see Jesus and they found a man from whom the demons have gone out sitting at Jesus' feet clothed and in his right mind. And they were quite frightened. They came to see what had taken place, and what they found was a demoni the dem de demoniac, the demon-possessed man, was at peace for the first time in probably many of their lifetime. They were gripped with fear, however, so they asked Jesus to leave. He represented an economic threat to them. The loss of pigs was an existential threat and a burden for the community, and they didn't want this guy to keep spreading this chaos all over their community. Are you kidding me? What about the man that was cured? But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging that he might accompany Jesus. But Jesus sent him away and said, Return to your house. Describe what great things God has done. So the man went away, proclaiming to the whole region the things that Jesus had done for him. The man was cured. He wanted to join Jesus and his merry band of merry little men, right? But Jesus told him, you have now a mission. Go and tell people about what has happened for you. You will do more good. And he did. He went and told people. He was so excited. This is really important. You see, you don't make a confession of faith or pray the sinner's prayer in order to get Jesus. Jesus sees our need. He touches us. He heals us. 
and we as a result respond to what Jesus has done. Anytime I make a confession of faith, anytime I repent of my sins, it's because Jesus first touched and healed me. He sees my need, and without my even asking for it, he begins the work of healing in my life. See, I too am like that demon-possessed man. Jesus has begun his work of healing in my life without my awareness and without my permission because Jesus sees a need and he just does. So what does this lesson mean for us? Certainly we are responsible to proclaim the good news to the people around us because the world is cynical, sarcastic, pessimistic, but we should be full of hope and optimism because of what Christ has done. This world right now, if you look at it, everybody's pessimistic about the world, about our country. Right-wingers, left-wingers. Oh, those darn left-wingers. Oh, it's all about those right-wingers. Depends on which side of the uh, battle you are on. And most everybody in the middle is just saying, maybe both of you guys are the problem. Okay? There's chaos right now in our country. There's chaos in the world. And so it's easy to be pessimistic, but we are Christians. We have the hope of Jesus Christ. We're not going to be infested in this political football of back and forth and back and forth. We are meant to be a stable presence that represents Jesus. It's not all. You know, if you notice in the box that we're told Americans are the most pessimistic people on the planet. It's crazy. We have more than anybody. But we're so pessimistic about life. Jesus is the one that needs to change that for us. This corrosive pessimism has destroyed our hope for the future. We've forgotten how bad it used to be, which I hate to say when you had a presidential candidate a few years back running on, make America great again. I kept thinking, when was it great exactly and for whom? Make it great like it was in the 1920s. Well, ask women how great it was in the 1920s. Make it great like it was in the 50s and 60s. Well, ask the black citizens of our country, how great was this country in the 50s and 60s for you? I mean, come on, people. It's ridiculous. There's never been that great gold time. It might have been great and golden for you because you were protected by your parents and everything worked well for you and for your family. But there's always been chaos and a great number of our citizens' lives. We need to be more sympathetic, for goodness sakes. We failed to acknowledge, or our, uh, we, our, we, we, we've forgotten how bad it used to be. And, but, but on the other side, I will confess, we also failed to acknowledge that there is daily progress. And there are some good things. As tough as it is, most of us would not really want to go back to the 50s and 20s because we do acknowledge that there are many things that are so much better. We need to be people of optimism. Christians are called to be countercultural. We should not buy into that pessimistic spirit. We cannot contribute to that corrosive pessimism because we have good news to proclaim. So I'm going to report some good news today. I'm going to give you some hope. All right, this is my life. A couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, my bicycle broke it. I was 30 miles from the house. I had no way to get a hold of anybody. A man stopped, threw my, hit my bike in his truck, took me 10 miles to the nearest bike shop so I could get it repaired. That's good news. People are not as nasty and hate-filled as you think they are. Most people are respectful of me, even when I'm driving. You know, the truth is, even in the midst of rush hour, people open up and let you in. There's an occasional jerk, and that kind of taints our day, but it's one jerk, and everybody else around us is trying to be kind to each other. Come on. Let's take a look at that. Most people wave when I let them in. Thank you. And I wave at most people because we, for the most part, are very pleasant to each other. Uh, I had a member who fixed my lawnmower when it was broken. Um, I had uh, my wife plants flowers in our yard every single year. I cannot tell you how many people come every single day and say, oh, 
I just love the fact that you've got, that makes my day every time I walk my dog by here, it makes me so happy. You see, we're spreading peace and hope to people by these little things. You know, there are people who send me cards. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Let us know what they're thinking of us. Oh, I'm concerned about you. I just got a couple of cards today because, you know, we've been going through a tif difficult time. People haven't forgotten us. They'll send me a text. How are you doing? I'm praying for you. That means the world to me. All right? Um, I'm here to tell you the best news of all, however. Amidst all of these great things that are happening because we Christians are are not people of pessimism. We're people of optimism. We're here to, to be here for each other, to announce good news. The best news of all is that God's love and healing has entered into my life as it does yours. So you think still the world is without hope? Yeah, I know there's chaos. But if all you see is the chaos and you don't see the hope that Jesus has come to bring, you need a heart transformation. You need to get rid of those demons in your life, okay? Maybe by starting, stop turning off that talk radio that's poisoning your brain. Or going to those far right or far left wing websites where they paint such a dire picture of everything. It's not the way things really are, by the way. Turn off your news, 24 hour news channels. Tune out political activists, because all they want to tell you is they make their hay on how terrible things are and how terrible 50% of the world that disagrees with them are. Tune them out. Ignore the purveyors of the cataclysmic future like some of these preachers who are almost thrilled all oh, the world, they the fulfillment of the end times right now. Oh, come on. You know what? I... I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this world is going on for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 more years. Okay. Yes, we're in the end times for the next 50,000 years because God is good, kind, and gracious. I'm an optimist with that. Yes, there's chaos in the world. But God is looking at a, a woman named Anna who's going to be born 50,000 years from now and saying, oh, oh, I can't wait for her to be born because that's the type of God we have. We need to start listening to Jesus. See, we've been set free. And despite the chaos of the world, we have hope. And the hope of the world is all around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that even amidst the chaos in my life, you center me with your hope and your promise, and your love, and with the kindness of other people. This is what we are to represent in this world, the kindness, the hope, the optimism of God. We can no longer buy into the purveyors of cataclysm and chaos. We need to represent something good, something kind, and something loving. So send us forth as you've set us free from those demons that possess us, set us free to be announcers of that good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ooh, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. I know it's been a little lengthier one today, but God's blessing to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.